Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to day three of the Amnesty Research Summit. We hope you've had a great weekend so far. Kicking us off today, we've got Jane, um, who's we welcome back. Um, some of you may recognise her from last year. Um, and so without further ado, I'll hand over to Jane. Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome um, to you all joining this session. Uh, my name's Jane Graham McMorrow, and I'm delighted to be here to present my latest work, Hidden Revealing. Uh, thank you to the summit crew for inviting me back again. Um, and it's been lovely to see all your faces this week um, and to hear all the great stuff and research everyone's been doing. It's truly mind blowing as usual. Um, so for those who were here for my presentation um, and exploration into Anne Lister's Crypt Hand last year, or have watched uh, the summit videos uh, on YouTube, uh, you'll be familiar with some of my type forms I've been working on. For those um, who are new to my work, um, I hope you enjoy my process of transforming type into image and the deep connection to Anne and her life. So just to give you uh, an outline in this session, there'll be a brief overlap from last year that I hope just serves as a refresher and as an introduction to the core and evolution of this particular project. I'll be sharing some of my process as research and how I use color scale and Anne's crypt hand to imbue my work along with my personal motivation for this project. So, okay. So there is an opportunity for you to interact with the artwork should you choose to, which didn't work 100% last year, but I hope I've nailed it this year. Um, so if you'd like to try that, then these are some codes here. You can see on your screen, there's a couple of QR codes. Uh, they are for, to download an app called iJack onto your mobile phones. So if you scan one of the codes, whether you've got an Android phone or an Apple, and that will come up and that will take you either to like Google Play, to the Android, or it'll take you to the Apple apps, and then you can just download iJack. And then later on, I'll, I'll um, share some further instructions with you, but I'll give you a few moments to do that if you wish. If you don't, and it's day three, a little bit tidy pops, that's absolutely fine because um, I will be able to show you through the presentation, uh, what would you see if you did uh, have the phone? But it's quite nice to have the full viewer experience. So if everybody who wants to has got that app, I can see some people scanning the screen just now. So I just give you a few seconds, moments to do that. Okay. If there's anyone who still needs some more time or hasn't done that, they can pop the message up in the chat. But if not, I'm gonna move on. Okay. All clear so far in the chat, so let's 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 move on. So specifically, uh, my research to analyst has started with my postgraduate masters in graphic arts at the University of the West of England in Bristol which is um, where I live right now. Uh, oh, wait, bird, do you need to go back? Sorry, I will go back because Barrett has asked me to wait. How are you doing, Barrett? doesn't work okay well for some maybe so we'll go on to the um you could just look up ijack in your search in your google play or the apple and you'll find it that way okay but we'll move on for now um as i say if you don't download it it's not the end of the world because we can come back to it um so yeah in my hometown bristol this is where i studied and specifically i was drawn 
to Anne's crypt hand in a calligraphic sense, which developed into a typographical study um, and manipulation into images. You can see here on the left, the page of Anne's diary, which most people will be very familiar with now. And then to the right, how I represented her code with type. Aesthetically, I kind of went into full geekery mode, studying the detail of Anne's crypt hand and evolving this into this digital realm. I developed a type library that's key to the visual language of my work, because without strong designs that stood by themselves, created by Anne's code, I wouldn't have the visual gateway needed from which to reveal Anne's story. Also, working on a digital platform gave me a lot more flexibility of how I could explore her type and how I could uh, exploit the code into new imagery. So this slide shows some of the glyph characters I created made up from Anne's crypt hand. So if you see on the far right, bottom right character there, they're actually two fives upside down and facing each other. Okay, so these are all code. They're all Anne's code, um, but in a digital form there. Um, I've previously discussed the importance of pattern to me and my connection to a rich history of women's art and as a way of women, a way of women recording their stories. So through the work of Emery Douglas from the Black Panthers, I was inspired as to how I could bring pattern into this project. In this image, the people, place, time and culture is so exquisitely communicated, I think, through the use of the pattern in the scarf and the hat and indeed the figures faces but that really kind of led me to how I might be able to bring pattern into my work. So here are some of my initial experiments and tests at including pattern. Um, these are a selection of ones I made from the more simple elements of Anne's code. So primarily they're, they're parts of her code that I hadn't previously used in actually forming the glyph characters. So I was really trying to pack as much of Anne's code into the images I was creating as possible. So here are some of the initial experiments and tests which some people will be familiar with, um, which include in pattern as the background in the characters. So I just experimented with those. So it's worth noting that these type forms that I've used here from, from digital typefaces are completely unchanged. So once I aligned them to Anne's code, I haven't manipulated them further. I've just constructed them and designed them and created these glyph characters. But I did, however, want to explore changing and manipulating the type forms. So I developed a testing process of extruding and warping the crypt hand type, evolving it into new forms. So on this slide, here's what code breakers will know is the word queer spelt out in Anne's code. Uh, to the diehard, please excuse me for taking the liberty of not using the shorthand for a double E that Anne uses and exercising artistic license in um, repeating the use of the two threes as her E's. So this is different ways I've, I've the process kind of was a very meticulous endeavor from the outset, both in terms of the aesthetic and the process. I wanted to really manipulate these type forms to communicate in a different way from the glyph characters. So really rearranging the architecture of each type form, manipulating them to a new state of balance, shape, texture, and proportion. So here we can see my initial application of color to the use of a it's kind of a very modern palette, which changes the mood and perception of the forms. They're a bit more playful, they're energetic. Um, um, I did in the end adhere to a different color palette, but this was just kind of part of my process. And these new forms are 
that a digitally manipulated type are the perfect vehicle for expressing a contemporary mode of communicating Anne's code and in themselves then become a code within a code. So why did I do all this? What's the meaning to all this? This is me a little visit to Shibden Hall with my manipulated type fabric that I made and then I turned it into a face mask for a COVID visit, as you do. Um, so at this point, I kind of want to discuss how important the end result of my work be a meaningful discourse of Anne's queer experiences that had power, insight, and the impact to surprise. I wanted to inform and subvert the viewer's perceptions and preconceptions. So through my drive to reveal meaning in my research, <clears throat> I read and digested over 1,000 pages of Anne's decoded diary entries, including artifacts such as letters of correspondence. Um, from this I became connected to her experiences like many here today uh, we've heard with previously and no doubt um, a very powerful experience connecting with Anne um, and I relate to Anne on many levels so I chose to reflect that through including something of my own voice within my final work. I went on to ask myself how can I give a rounded view into Anne and her experiences? How can I convey something of what has changed and what has not through the centuries? You know, obviously it's a tall order through the voice of a small collection of screen prints, but that however was my impetus and it was my desire to do that. So I chose to narrow things down and I chose to reveal Anne through her own words in order to stay connected to her truths and to introduce and represent Anne as herself in the purest sense I could. I created a collection of six images revealing Anne's internal, external, her connection and reflection along with my personal voice. And the last piece is an unfettered proud shout with a contemporary declaration of queerness. So the pieces deliver how she felt, how she felt, how others saw her, her sexual interaction with other women and what role her journal played in her life. The contextualization was through a statement of my own in the 21st century that illuminates struggle, courage and a fight for freedom, which is something of which I share with Anne, contrasted by the proud contemporary shout of the final piece. So this bit's a bit wordy, but it will make sense when you see the final pieces that I've used these six reflections of these six different places to try and bring this rounded kind of story representation, because this is for people that do know of Anne Lister. It's for people who might not want to know of Anne Lister, who might not want to engage with queer art or queer history and also for those that want to see themselves reflected of people that don't uh, just never heard of her just never heard of her so that that was my aim so on to the screen printing um, when I looked at creating the final images I considered their scale their color um, the level of detail complexity and the methodology of laying down the actual prints with regards to the actual screen print sizes, I researched the online archive for the National Portrait Gallery, discovering a portrait painting size from the 19th century called, which sounds a little bit rude, but it's not a full bishop, um, which uh, uses historical, it's a kind of correct portrait dimensions, which, so I use that in my work. And it presented me with an opportunity to layer my prints with a further historical reference to Anne's era. And it also contributed to the prints reference as glyph portraits, which is what I finally called them, because they a portrait is not only a likeness, but is something that it reveals something about somebody. 
And so I feel that this is intrinsic to revealing part of Anne's story. So color is a powerful medium and can be used as signifiers and messaging. And I wanted to exploit this fully within my work. So I looked to use a rich opulent color palette, including metallics in gold, silver and brass, especially to elevate Anne Lister as a reflection of not only her own um, societal aspirations, but as an important queer woman in history. So I worked on a cohesive and simple palette to link and bring the final pieces together. Here you can see on the far right picture that I've ground silver metallic pellets in a pestle and mortar, which was added to silver paint in order to get the metallic qualities and the reflective effect in the final prints, which I also did with all the golds as well. The printing process itself entailed lots of detailed testing and adjusting in order to render the quality and detail of the pattern and print I was looking for, which I did find out from one of the experienced technicians at university. Um, I was trying to make screen print do what it doesn't want to do, uh, which was a bit of a, a bit of a blow because it's so far down the project by that point. I just thought I can't change anything now, no matter how difficult it is. And it's in my graphic design background that I'm used to digital printing, where lining up and registering a pattern over a color or anything, the print work is done by the computer. It's done within the millimeter. So all my designs were created with that knowledge. Um, so that was uh, quite an experience. So that's not the case, however, when you're using a fabric screen and pushing in ink through by hand. Um, oops, I've gone too far, sorry. Uh, so when um, you're pushing ink through hand, um, however, I'm extremely pleased that I did persevere and I, the only way to combat it was to attend to every single detail of the process in order to get the quality of work I ended up with, which included using exactly the same screen for each print from using the way that I use the squeegee, that I use that squeegee, which is the one that you use to press through the ink on the screen, exactly the same way of the weft of the screen to try and minimize any kind of movement to try and get that registration. It was uh, quite a task, I can tell you that. Um, but as I say, I'm really pleased with how things ended at the end, uh, really high quality prints, even if I say so myself. So if this wasn't all enough, <laughs> um, this project involves augmented reality. So it's motion graphics, which some people also can know as animation, but not in the Mickey Mouse sense, but um, the type. Um, and that interacts with augmented reality. So it kind of gives the, this, the whole point of this part of the project was to give the opportunity to the viewer to experience the hidden and the reveal. What appears as a static image as the screen print then is transformed through your mobile phone into a motion graphic piece that then performs in front of you and reveals a queer history. It's, it was a totally new discipline for me to learn, including the software. Um, and I feel my work improved as I created the six motion graphics for the pieces. I really wanted to find a way to illustrate how the glyphs were composed and their significance and relationship to Anne's original crypt hand. So I looked to maintain a cohesive visual language and from the print, you know, from the prints and through the animations, I repeated the characteristics of this dynamic layout across Anne's quotations. So for my own quote, I favored like a, it's a kinetic display of where my word expresses different movements akin to the meaning of the word. Um, and that transforms through the colors of the inclusive LGBTQIA rainbow flag. Um, 
So this is some of the software. And as you can see, um, th this was one of the simpler ones, can I say? And, um, and it's a whole new experience to, to get the head, my head around the software, but also then to try and bring a rhythm and a movement into the motion graphics. And I can say I did my very best. Um, I can say that uh, I think that I, I, was, I, was, I was pleased that it, it felt like it did improve as I went along, but I would, I would say that there is definitely more to explore in this area for me. Um, yeah, so kind of in summaration, that's kind of been my process, um, but I would like to reference an amazing historian at this point and professor who has inspired my work since I first discovered her on my undergraduate degree. Um, it helped me to illuminate and summarize some of my work in its core um, intentions. And so in answering the question, which I did through my MA, I said was how can a typographical deconstruction of Anne Lister's crypt hand offer a context for a telling of queer history? The answer lies within creating my work as interactive and relational events. The audience choose to activate the AR elements. So maybe when it, people see it, they choose to download or they choose not to. So that, that's not in my control, um, but they do get the choice to interact with the AR elements, which provides a setting for revealing, for telling and relating to and with a queer history. So the professor I'm referring to in her book, Why History Matters, Life and Thought, Gerda Lerner, she really pointedly asserts in her book, a meaningful conversation to the past demands above all active engagement. And she expands on that by writing, it demands imagination and empathy so we can fathom worlds unlike our own. And I really, I really took this to, to be that the way I wanted to communicate with Anne was to really open a door for people, one for intrigue and everything for people who maybe knew about Anne, for, but for those that really didn't, just to really open that door in quite a gentle way. And the prints are actually called gateway prints because the prints are the gateway, they're the bit that attract you to the work in order then to reveal this part of queer history. Okay, so let's get on to the final work, all the sweat and tears. And this is where, so this, this piece is called um, Lioness and is actually, for those who have got a little pull out of me, can see the final print is hanging behind my head here. So that's the real McCoy behind me. Um, this is where if you have been successful in downloading iJack, this is where you can scan this QR code here to the right in the open app. So once you open the app, you can look to that little eye icon on, on your screen. Normally it's on the left-hand side at the bottom. And then you can hold up the phone to the QR code. And it will then, you should see a little bar where it then decides to download the animation, the, the motion graphic. And there's a little button where you have to slide it to the side to make sure that it's on. So for those with phones, we've gone through this process. And see people oh, doing stuff. Oh my like God. Video. Okay, so that's work for someone. Okay, so um, I'm now going to move on to those who can't actually see that, uh, haven't got their phones. And this is what you would see if you held up your phone to the print. And here we see actually Anne's code there.
which is this this was really important quote for me because that that's what she was saying that's what we say as queer folk i believe there is a difference but in the end of the day it's just love so everyone just chill out about queer people <laughs> um okay this is the second in the piece this is called pirate and i think i call them pirate because of the eyes seems like the heavy eyeliner the pirate <laughs> might wear or um so this is the next code for anyone to uh scan and again that will download the motion graphic and can i say once you have got all these on your phone you can they stay on there and then that's it they stay within the app and you can use them whenever you like So that downloads. I'll give you a moment to do that. This is uh, made with uh, silver, which you saw me, you saw that image of me grinding up the pellets to add to the silver paint. And so I'm looking at the moment, it looks like that might be working. For people yeah she's nodding her head i can just see <laughs> thank you <laughs> you are my guides my darlings um and whoops no 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 don't go too far no here we go So this is the exterior element it's it's how people how what people people act towards Anne and say because we all know she's magnificent and she did have an amazing way of moving through the world of her time but you know things land from time to time and that's true for Anne as it is for any of us I think And this is your next QR code. Simply titled three because of the use of threes. Uh, and let's I'm watching and my little screen doesn't tell me the names anymore of our lovely couple in America who I see Hold up, they're my guide at the moment, smiling and nodding. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, okay. So the animation, this is, this is the one, you can see I'm getting to the flow there. Oh, that's smooth. That's much better for me. The animation is improving in quality, I believe there. Do you remember that one? Oh, I say, um, quite fruity. I believe, wow, 12th of November, 1824. Mm, Paris, methinks, maybe. I think that's where she was when that was happening. Uh, yes, definitely. Yes, Barlow, Daughter Jane, music lessons, all of that, yes. But um, yeah, that was a kind of interesting relationship, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Okay, so and here we go. So this is the next piece, who has been called seven because again, the main frame of their face is made out of a number seven, although it reminds me a bit of a, I don't know. Norman, I was going to call them Norman. Anyway, this is the next one. This is the brass. So I try to change the metallics and try to move through as a representation of Anne's uh, social climbing 
So she may have come from brass, but she certainly was going towards rose gold and gold, in my opinion. That was definitely where she wanted to be, for sure. So some of these colours kind of reflect her aspirations and where she was going. So for those who don't have the phone, And so this is to obviously contextualize the meaning of the diary for Anne, how she could be free, how she could be herself. Um, and her acknowledging the crypt and what that was for, what, what that function served for her. So, you know, there were many quotes I could have used, but I hope that I've managed to choose those that kind of do really lend themselves to, you know, the interior, exterior, and the context of the diaries for Anne, her journal. And this is number five. So after this is one more. Uh, this particular character is called Oddo. Um, and this is me, <laughs> as it goes. This, this is the one that represents my voice. And this is why it departs from the really embellished pattern the imbued code of Anne into pattern because this is uh, got more contemporary feel because it's from the 21st century so this is representing I suppose me in a way but of course it's still made up of Anne's code um, O double D O hence the name Oddo. This was a very tricky animation for me because I was animating colour and type um, and this is the one that uses places itself in contemporary society by using the inclusive LGBTQIA flag in its colors. Um, so for those that don't, it's a little bit, you have to concentrate on this one, I think a little bit more for, to, to be able to read it. So here we go. which I'm sure many of us have done um, in our lives to be who we are. And then my final piece, uh, which is printed in a rose gold, which you can't quite get the full Monty from there, which is completely sumptuous and beautiful ink to work with. And this is the manipulated type. Um, and there's a QR code for you there to download that onto iJack. And this is my contemporary shout, the kind of leaving the shackles of any kind of worry about being queer and being very proud and out and just kind of, you know, when you feel 100% <laughs> about it, because you don't always feel, I don't always feel 100% in the, given situations, new situations and such like, sometimes you just are like, yeah, and, and this is a little bit like that. So it's a little bit of attitude in there. And <clears throat> I'd like to say that um, in all of this, I did my quotes, I, I did manage to work with some of them, uh, Summit Crew, because I did put out, or, and other people, I put out some tweets for some quotes back. So I did try and uh, so there was a little bit of collaboration there, but also my main collaborator for this piece 
was Prue from Minor Bird Sounds, who's absolutely amazing. And she is the person that has done the music for the Anlister Summit um, this year and last year. Uh, fabulous to work with Prue composing this piece. And um, yeah, she was amazing. So a massive shout out to Minor Bird Sounds and a very deep grateful thank you to her. And I'll move on to those. So just uh, for anyone who's ready for this, who doesn't have their phones, turn your volume up. Turn your volume right up. And if you don't like this kind of music, then you'll turn it down real quick. Okay. And that is the end of my presentation. I've got some contact details down there on the bottom, but that's something I'm sure you can get off the summit crew anyway. And so thank you so very much for coming to see my work. I was blown away the first time um, that anyone would be slightly interested <laughs> in my madcap research into Anne Lister. Um, but uh, as it turns, there's a whole community of you, which is absolutely delightful and brilliant. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand back over to Jessica. Thank you so, so much, Jane. There's so many comments in the chat just really appreciating the work. They think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so oh. we, we've we got about five minutes or so. Um, there's been some really good questions in the chat as you've been presenting. But what we'd like to do is invite people to join us in the water closet um, after this um, scheduled session so that we can get through all of those questions because um, there's been some really, really good questions. But one thing I want to make sure that we do in this session is just to ask you kind of what's next? Where do we go from here? And is this stuff available to buy? Because I'm sure there's plenty of customers kind of watching you right now who might be interested in actually purchasing some of this. Thank you. Um, what's next? I don't know. I'm working on that at the moment. So I'm kind of transitioning from um, graphic designer more into artist, my artist realm. Um, and um, I am hoping to do some exhibitions. I'm hoping to at some point uh, speak to Shibden Hall. Um, I'd like to get something there if I can. Um, and yeah, there's some other exhibitions. There's the Royal Society Summer Exhibition in London and I'd like to submit to there if I can. Well, I can submit it whether they take me or not is another thing obviously altogether. So yeah, and there's also a possibility I can see this as in a bus stop. So when you get the adverts in the bus stop to sell you biscuits and cups of tea or buy a magazine, actually what you could end up doing is having a queer experience by your phone and having queer history revealed. And when you're waiting for a bus, you've got time. And also that's a place where not everybody goes to galleries, not everybody goes to exhibitions. One, they're not always accessible to people, but sometimes they're uh, for cost or location. Um, and, but if you're just, you know, catching a bus and then you decide to use your phone, for those people that aren't aware of queer history or might not normally interact with it, it presents a kind of, it's kind of subvert, that's the subverting part for me is subverting a, a, a regular space in, and then creating a queer ex history experience. So that would be great. So we, we'll see, I don't know, that's an idea. And, as it happens, after last time, a few people did approach me for my work, but these, these big ones are quite expensive. And what I didn't want it to do is to be price prohibitive because what's the point of making artwork if people can't enjoy it? So I went back into the studio and I created a whole set, apart from number seven, I didn't get round to seven, but I've created a whole set of these prints in a smaller size 
that go to like an A3, especially for summit people and just for people that be a bit more accessible price wise. Um, but they're all still hand silk screen printed by me and metallic inks. And so they're not digital copies, they're all handmade. Um, and yeah, they're available to sell. And they're even in biodegradable seller bags um, and everything. So I've got some of those that can be posted out to people. So awesome. can get with me, my website, you can see them, you can order them on the website or you can, um, yeah, direct message me, Twitter me, email me, whatever. Brilliant. Excellent. So if people want to um, purchase something, just get in touch with you directly then. And um, yeah, you and can look at um, the website there, janeartist.com, feeling brave that day. That URL wasn't used, funnily enough. So um, people are quite shy to call themselves artists, which me included. But so, yeah, janeartist.com. Um, or you can email me at janeartiststudio at gmail.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. For no. giving me this opportunity again honestly very grateful to the summit squad thank you so much for coming back to talk to us again um it's been an absolute pleasure to have you um as i said um we'll we'll go into the water closet um to answer the questions from the audience if that's okay yeah so i'd encourage everybody to join Joyfully. us afterwards and just on the note of the water closet actually um, just to let everybody know that um, unfortunately there's been a change to today's schedule at the last minute um, and so instead of design and identity at Lister's Shipton Hall we're going to have a bonus round of vocabularising with Jane at 2pm not this Jane, Jane Kendall but this Jane hopefully will be able to join us in the water closet now um, to go um, over some of those audience questions um, if that's okay but thank you ever so much everybody for joining us and um, we hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Jane, um, for sharing your incredible you. artwork with us. And um, there's loads and loads of really um, lovely comments in the chat. Um, Thank and, you so much. Um, there's a couple of questions asking in the um, about where to find the water closet. Um, it's in the Eventbrite page, and you should have an email um, that links you through to that. And it's the same link that we've used all weekend. So we'll transition over there now, and uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you so, so much. See you there, everybody. Thank you.